In the second half of chapter 11, we're going to take a look at phase diagrams. Phase diagrams are basically going to help us determine under what conditions we'd expect to find what phase of a molecule. Under what conditions of temperature and pressure, right, would we find that molecule as a solid, liquid, or a gas? Chapter 11 will be the only homework that we have due this weekend. It'll be due Sunday the 26th. I will get the exam grades posted shortly, and I'll update your grades along with the homework and play posit participation as well. So the last class, we looked at intermolecular forces. Basically, how do we have an understanding about the physical properties of a substance? We go to the intermolecular forces, and that's going to be determined by the polarity. So do we have just London dispersion forces? Do we have dipole-dipole forces or hydrogen bonding forces or even ion-dipole uh, forces at play in helping determine the properties, the physical properties of that sample that we're looking at? So things like the boiling point or the melting point or the viscosity. Today, we're going to look at some of those properties. Today, we're going to look at viscosity and surface tension, and then think about how that's a product of the intermolecular forces of that sample. So if we look at a beaker of water or a glass of water, that sample is filled with millions of little water molecules. And if we were to look at an individual water molecule within the sample, here's our water molecule within the sample. And if you look at that, it has intermolecular forces all around it. It's being pulled up, it's being pulled to the left, it's being pulled to the right, it's being pulled down. The entire molecule, because within the sample, is being pulled in all directions by other intermolecular forces. However, if we look at the surface of that glass of water, we notice that the molecules along the surface, there's an unequal distribution of those intermolecular forces. We notice all of those intermolecular forces along the surface are pulling that molecule into the sample. They're pulling that molecule within the sample, and I do not have any opposing forces pulling the molecule the opposite direction, right? Those do not exist. And so because of that, we're going to experience some unique properties along that surface boundary between the water and the next phase. So in this case, the air above that, the gas phase above this sample. We're going to experience a little bit different properties because of the unequal distribution of those intermolecular forces, and they're pulling the molecule farther within the sample because of that unequal distribution of those intermolecular forces. And that's going to help determine uh, something like our viscosity, for example. So our viscosity is basically our resistance to flow. And so to think of viscosity, think of something like comparing how easy it is to pour a glass of water versus pouring uh, a sample of honey or a sample of molasses. As you increase the viscosity, you increase the resistance to flow. It makes it harder to pour that sample the more viscous it becomes. So viscosity is simply our resistance to flow, right? We can think of versus honey. Honey is more viscous. It will take a lot longer to pour the same volume of honey. And it's the same with motor oil. So different motor oil comes with a different ranking. That ranking is a is telling you the viscosity of that motor oil. And that's why under certain conditions, different temperature ranges, right, we wanna use a different ranking, a different weight of our motor oil. So we have SAE 40 and SAE 10. The higher the SEA number, the more viscous that sample is. And that's what we see here. If I started pouring both of these motor oils at the same time, obviously the SAE 10 is the less viscous motor oil because I'm able to pour a larger volume of that motor oil in the same period of time. So now looking at those samples of hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, and decane, as we go down this series here, each of those alkanes has one more carbon, right? The carbon chain grows one carbon in length each time we go down. And more importantly, we see an increase in the viscosity. So hexane is less viscous than decane. So where 
might that viscosity come from? What would be an explanation for why decane is more viscous than hexane? Why does decane have a greater resistance to flow than hexane? And the answers in the statement above, viscosity increases with stronger intermolecular forces. So as I go from hexane to decane, both of those only have London dispersion forces at play. So we have the same intermolecular forces. However, decane has a much longer carbon chain because it has a longer carbon chain. It's got more surface area for London dispersion forces. So cumulatively, it's going to have more intermolecular forces. It's going to have more right, holding those molecules together and a greater resistance to flow. It'll be more viscous than hexane because of a greater number of those London dispersion forces. We can also see that in the product of surface tension, and that's what we were looking at with that glass of water. The surface tension is really because of that boundary between the water layer and the air around it, right? We want to maximize intermolecular forces within the sample because that's the driving force, right? I'm going to form the strongest intermolecular forces within the sample. I want to maximize those intermolecular forces because those intermolecular forces between the molecule in a sample are greater than the intermolecular forces between the molecule and the surrounding environment. And that's what causes the water to beat up. So if I have this surface and a droplet of water lands on that surface, here's my droplet of water. I have the air around it, but to maximize the intermolecular forces, right? Water can't really interact with air too much. It really doesn't have too many forces, intermolecular forces between water and the air. So to maximize the intermolecular forces that it can participate in, like hydrogen bonding, water beads up. And that's what we see here. We see the water beat up because I'm maximizing the intermolecular forces within that sample. Right? I do not have as strong forces between the water and the surrounding air. Right? Those aren't positive. Those aren't helpful interactions. So as a result, to maximize those intermolecular forces, the droplet of water beads up on itself to maximize those interactions within that sample of water, to maximize those hydrogen bonding interactions. And we see the end product of that in these two examples here. If everyone's ever seen a water skimmer walk across the water, right, that bug is able to slide across the surface of the water because exactly that, because of the surface tension. Because of the surface tension, there are greater intermolecular forces along the surface pulling those molecules into the sample, creating a barrier along the top because we've, we've, and the net result is pulling those molecules closer together, pulling those molecules into the sample. That creates a barrier along the surface that the water skimmer can take advantage of by not weighing too much and spreading out its weight over a larger surface area the water skimmer is unable to break that surface tension of water and it's able to skim across the surface. You can also float a penny or a paper clip on top of a, a sample of water by taking advantage of the same thing. Those intermolecular forces and in the surface tension along that water air barrier, right? The weight of this object would have to break those intermolecular forces to break through the surface and sink into the sample. And so here's a good example, too, of thinking of the difference between intermolecular forces within a sample and forces between two samples. So water and glass. So looking at this sample of water in the test tube, the glass also has a polar surface. 
glass is silicon dioxide, and so we can have similar intermolecular forces between the water and between the glass. We can have similar interactions, and those interactions between the glass and the water actually pull the water sample up the glass because we have cohesive forces between the water and the glass. However, if I look at the sample of mercury, the meniscus on the sample of mercury is bent the opposite direction, and it's bent the opposite direction because within water and glass, there are similar interactions. Between the, the mercury and the glass, they are both drastically different in their intermolecular forces, and so they are not able to interact with each other. So within the mercury sample, the strongest forces are between mercury and two different mercury atoms. They're not able to interact with the glass. And so as a result, to maximize those intermolecular forces, to maximize the strongest intermolecular forces available, the forces between mercury are stronger than the forces between mercury and the glass. And as a result, we see mercury beat up the opposite direction because it wants to maximize the interactions within the sample of mercury, minimizing its contact with the glass. All right, the opposite of the water-glass interaction because with the glass and water, we can have, right, those adhesive forces between the glass and the water are of similar magnitude as the cohesive forces within the sample. So it's just as good for us to interact with that water and that result is pulling that sample up the sides and creating that U-shaped meniscus that we've all seen with a test tube full of water. We can also think about this uh, if you've ever used Rain-X on the surface of your windshield. So here on the left is a windshield that's been treated with Rain-X and here on the right is your standard windshield. And so what that does, we just talked about the, the adhesive forces between water and glass. And so here are my hydroxyl groups from the water. Right, I can have, because of the surface of the glass, I'm gonna have similar attractive forces between the water and the glass. And what that's gonna do is flatten out that bead of water because I have similar interactions within the sample as I do between the sample, between the water and the glass. So if we coat that surface with Rain-X, what Rain-X does is it basically blocks those intermolecular forces. It blocks those interactions. So the surface of that droplet of water still has these hydroxyl groups of the water, but now it's no longer able to interact with the surface of that glass. And so now to maximize its intermolecular forces, rather than interact with the glass and flatten out, it beads up within itself. And that's what we see. We see a much larger contact angle with the surface, a nice droplet of water, a nice bead of water, and that's why if you treat your windshield with rain -X, the water quickly and easily beads up and moves off the windshield. Whereas if you have an untreated windshield, the water doesn't move off as quickly because it's interacting, right? It's taking advantage of intermolecular forces. It's taking advantage of glass and water adhesive forces to stick to your windshield. Whereas the Rain-X windshield, we've minimized that surface area of contact. A smaller surface area of contact makes it easier for that droplet of water to move off your windshield. So in the next part of this module, we're gonna take a look at now, what is the energy required to go between these different phases? What's the energy and the process to go from a gas to liquid to solid, or the opposite direction, from a solid liquid to a gas? So we're increasing pressure or we're changing the temperature uh, of that sample.